good morning, Church One. Great to be with you on this Labor Day weekend. Uh, let me pray for us as we open God's Word. Lord, we need you. Our hearts, our souls need you. We need you to touch our lives. We need you to encourage us. Uh, we need you to open our eyes to see new things in our world in different ways. You have given us this precious resource, the Bible, to do many of these things. And so I pray as we uh, open your word that that would happen, that you would open our eyes to see our world afresh, that we would sense uh, in this book your love for us. And uh, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Amen. So we are gonna be preaching today out of the book of Philemon. It is a very small book, one chapter, I think 25 verses. And I have been preaching in various ways, um, gosh, for over 28 years. And I have never, ever preached on the book of Philemon. Uh, so this is sort of an interesting ground for all of us. Um, and what I'd love to do is read it for you. Uh, again, it's small. It's like 20, we're going to read just 20 of the verses because the last verses are just conclusions. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll jump into it a little bit. But this is the letter of Paul to Philemon. And um, I'm going to read verses 1 to 21. And it reads like this. I'm in the new NRSV. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the heart of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. And so just real quick, um, we see here Paul is writing to this guy Philemon, who is must be a generous, life-giving person who hosts, hosts a church in his house. And um, we don't know a lot about him, um, but they obviously knew each other, or Paul at least knew of him. But the reason he's writing Philemon, we're about to find out, he says uh, in verse eight, for this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Paul is in prison and he wants to ask Philemon a question and he says, I could tell you what to do, but I want you to do it out of your own heart. And this is what he's asking. He says, I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. So we're, you know, commentators are not 100% sure, but what most people assume is that Onesimus was a slave of Philemon's and that he escaped and that somehow Paul connected with him um, when he was in prison and Philemon uh, was a Christian. Onesimus may have become a Christian under Paul's ministry or was a Christian, but Onesimus probably as an escaped slave of Philemon's, he may have even stolen from Philemon before he left. And Paul uh, discovers this, and now they're deciding what to do. Should Paul just let Onesimus stay, or the fact that he knows that he belonged to Philemon, does he send him back, that kind of stuff. Um, so he says, um, He's, he says, I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. 
but it preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about you owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. And so Paul is basically writing this little letter because he has... Philemon's slave Onesimus, and he's sending him back and hoping that Philemon has mercy on Onesimus as he returns. It's an interesting little book and an interesting little snapshot into the life of the church, but one of the real legit questions about this little book is why is it even in the Bible? I mean, there's not a lot of theology. There's just not a lot there that you would think makes it uh, one of the 66 books that make up the Bible is this little letter uh, to Paul, to this guy, Philemon, about an escaped slave. And that's what we're gonna talk about this morning. Why is this in the Bible? And it has actually proven to be a really useful little book over the history of church, the church. And I'm gonna kind of point out um, two reasons that I think uh, it's in the scriptures. And I'm saying one you see and one you usually don't. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Why is it in the Bible? I'll give you two reasons. There's probably a ton more, but I'm gonna give you two. One that you can kind of see and one that we usually don't. And so the, the one that you see that like the significance of the Bible is this whole issue of slavery, right? That the Bible, uh, particularly the New Testament, was written, as we talked about last week, in the Greco-Roman world. And one of the realities of the Greco-Roman world was that slavery was rampant. Now, they were a land-based economic system. And so the slavery that they had, in some ways, uh, was a part of their economic system. People could be slaves. They might be in debt and sell themselves as slaves to, and work themselves free. There's all sorts of reasons that people could be slaves that maybe are different from the kind of the the race-based slavery that we have in our history and uh, what was particularly toxic about the slavery that we have in our American history is that it was, it was race-based and it, it, it kind of treated people like they weren't people anymore and um, we're still paying the legacy of all that as a country. But it maybe wasn't exactly the same uh, you know, slavery that they had back then, but it still wasn't great to be a slave. I'm not underselling that. But it was a different economy and a different way of things. And, and Paul, um, you know, this gives us a little snapshot into that. And frankly, when this was written and when the church was deciding what to put in the Bible, there were lots and lots of slaves that probably made up the church. But one of the things that I think is really fascinating about why this is included in the Bible is, you know, one of the great questions of the Bible is, was Paul pro-slavery? N.T. Wright in his huge big commentary about the New Testament, you know, talks about that. And and, um, he basically says that Paul uh, was not pro-slavery in the way that he often gets accused. He uh, sees it. It's hard for him probably not to envision an economic system without slavery. And so Paul, just like we talked about last week, you know, the, the Bible often acknowledges the reality of a culture without affirming all of it. And that's what you see here in Philemon, that the Bible acknowledges the reality. Paul acknowledges the reality of, of slavery, but he doesn't affirm it completely. In fact, he sort of goes out of his way to undercut it. And the way that he goes out of his way to undercut it is to do this basic move. And you see it in the middle of of this letter. He says, uh, for, for, for perhaps for this reason, 
uh, Onesimus was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, and how much more to you. Paul is undercutting this entire institution of slavery and the reality that an owner would want to see a slave as less than a full person by Paul's acknowledging he is a brother. He is one of your brothers. He's, he's more than a slave. Don't see him just as a slave. And the, you know, Paul is affirming the humanity and the dignity of slaves as people and as brothers and sisters in Christ. And when you understand that in some ways it undercuts, right? It undercuts the way that many think of slavery. William Wilberforce, a famous English um, parliament member who was basically responsible for abolishing the slave trade in modern day England, uh, they they had like, um, I don't want, they had they didn't do stickers back then, but they had artwork and stuff like this produced. And it had a slave in chains, an African slave in chains. And over top it said, am I not your brother? Wilberforce keyed into this idea that slaves are people. And so the oppressive system, especially the oppressive system of slavery in England, had to be undercut and ultimately overturned because it was denying the humanity of the person. And so I think it's really, and, and so this little book of Philemon has always sort of been a, a, a key sort of social economic statement that really worked to transform a lot of the world. And so you wouldn't expect a little book like that to carry a punch, but it does. And it, and it really, this letter, you know, has served as a tool to bring justice, right? And because it sees the rights and dignity of all people and to show that those rights are ordained by God. You know, it's interesting uh, that the lectionary puts this passage in on Labor Day. Labor Day is the day where we really recognize labor and in particular, organized labor. And if you look at kind of the history of the world and the economy, when the, when the world transitioned from kind of a land-based, agricultural-based economy to a uh, capitalistic-based economy where it, your wealth went from not what you sort of produced off the land, but your wealth was built on your labor, one of the profound challenges that kind of cultures had was recognizing the dignity of labor. And early on in capitalism, there was a lot of exploitation of labor. And, and so organized labor was a way in which like people kind of fought back for their dignity. And it's fascinating to kind of link the history of the church and the way the church has, has, you know, not always perfectly or rightly or on time, but the church has continued to stand, just like it stood for the dignity of slaves, to stand for the dignity of labor and that people have the right to work and earn a living and not be stripped of their humanity and their work. And, uh, you know, it's the church has been a voice for that over time, partly kind of laid down this groundwork that you know, Philemon uh, has for us. You know, there's, um, I read in preparation for this, and I'm not gonna read them to you, but I, led, I read two Catholic uh, encyclicals, which were written by the popes, statements about, you know, the dignity of labor and laying down basically a theology of like labor. One of them was uh, called Rerum Novarum, and it was written by Pope Leo XIII in 1891. And it was a time, in 1891, was a time of real great tension between the working class and the owning class. And again, capitalism was relatively new on the scene and there was a lot we were, people were trying to work out and figure out. Communism, because of the exploitation of labor, is, is starting to build and bubble up. And, and Pope Leo XIII was one of the first popes to really speak into this. And he writes this encyclical meant for the whole world to hear about the rights of labor and workers and what they adv advocated for you know was was basically a lot of what we ended up getting to except it took a lot of pain to get us there 
And then I, there was a second encyclical called Sentissimus Annus written by Pope John Paul II, written in 1991. Sentissimus Annus literally means 100 years later. And John Paul II is writing this um, 100 years after Rerum Novarum. And he's writing this encyclical to now talk about the fall of communism and that capitalism in many ways has sort of won the day as an economic system. But capitalism can't lose its soul. It can't lose the value and the dignity of the human person. And if communism is falling, we need a kind of a dignified capitalism to fill in the gaps. And he writes in this historical moment, and it's very fascinating to see the things he's saying and advocating for organized labor, but also private property ownership and the, the state to manage the rules of law and ownership. And it's actually very thoughtful and it's, it's grounded in this theology and it's an example of sort of building off what Paul laid down in this little book of Philemon. It accepts a culture and an economic reality without affirming something that is that destroys the dignity of people. And in that tension, we are to work much out. And so <laughs> that may be more than you care to think about, right, on a Labor Day. But I just found it fascinating to, to kind of do that. And so I share that. But that's kind of what is you see and you and jumps off the page of this little passage. Here's what we don't typically see. When you read this passage, right, the, the drama of Philemon, the owner, Onesimus, the escaped slave, and Paul intervening and trying to, you know, kind of lay it a little hard on Philemon to get him to do what he wants him to do. Like, we see all that, right? It's, it's very personal, it's real, it's kind of right out there. It's not, it's not, it's not uh, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out what Paul is like wanting to see happen. And so we, we see all that, but, what we often don't see in this personal letter is a story of grace, right? This is Paul basically appealing to Philemon to give grace, to give this Onesimus uh, grace, what he doesn't deserve. And the reason he's appealing to him to give him grace is because Paul says, Philemon, you have been given grace. God, you know, sort of met you when you didn't deserve it. It's interesting to link this up with the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15 and the, the, the father, right, waiting for the son to return. And the son says, like, let me work with the pigs. And it's like, no, you're my son, and puts on a robe and celebrates him. It's this amazing picture of grace, right? And that, that, that's really what, in many ways, bleeds through this very personal letter on a very practical issue, is the reality of grace and how grace sort of should invade and bleed through our lives. Victor Hugo uh, wrote the, the book Les Miserables, uh, it became a famous Broadway musical and it became a movie. And um, I remember we taking our kids to the movie and they, they sang through the whole movie. The music's awesome. I'm sure many of you have seen it, but I, my son Michael at some point turned to me in the middle of the, mu the movie and he's like, when are they gonna stop singing? <laughs> but like, it's an, it's an amazing story, but it's a story of grace, right? Jean Valjean is a, is a prisoner who escapes and he, he ends up, um, or I think he's a prisoner who's been released and he ends up in the home of this Catholic bishop and he steals the bishop's gold and, and his kind of tableware because he feels like it's his only chance to get any money to kind of rebuild his life. And, but he steals it from this bishop and they capture him and they see the bishop's stuff and they bring him back to the bishop and they say, have you, have you, you know, here's this, he's stolen this from you. And the bishop says, oh no, he didn't steal it. I gave it to him. And he says, oh, and you forgot this. And this little act of, grace, right, transforms Jean Valjean's life. It's an amazing story, but it's a story about grace and how grace bleeds through and transforms. And that's, in a way, what Paul's writing in this little book of Philemon. You know, sometimes I like to find artwork, and so I found um, this painting. I, the painting, I believe, is called St. Paul's 
writing his epistle. And the author, the artist, they believe, is a Valentine de Bologna. It is painted in uh, 1618 to 1620. Uh, and it's a, it's a unique, it's a very, uh, they call it a very Baroque style of art. It is a, um, it's very, uh, it was dark, right? You can see, if you see this picture, uh, hopefully we'll have a slide of it up. You, you see it's very, it, it uses big contrast between light and darkness. There's a lot of, there's a lot of darkness, mostly darkness, but then there's light and yet, and, and there's brightness kind of on Paul sitting in his desk writing and he's writing and, he, and, and, and they're trying to be very realistic, right? In many ways, the, the, the point of this, this Baroque style of art was to, to, to realistically help you engage with what the human people were like doing this. And so he's painting this like realistic picture of Paul sitting at his desk, writing one of his epistles. You see, now Paul wouldn't have had little books on his desk back then. They would have had scrolls, but you'll, you can see Paul sitting there like writing, um, writing. And, and, and it's, it's meant to give you a picture of the human and Paul writing these sacred words that make up our scripture. It's a fascinating painting, but one of the most interesting parts of the painting is a part that you don't typically see. And in fact, I'm hoping if, you, if it, this shows up, you can see it in the slide. But if it doesn't, you may have to go and Google it to even blow it up a little bit. But if, if we were looking at this painting in an art museum, one of the things that you would see is Paul is writing, right? But in his, on his desk, you see a reflection of a face. And you naturally think, well, that reflection is Paul's face, right? Like he's writing his desk and, you know, it's a glass desk or whatever and his face is reflecting. But here's the thing. In the real painting, there is no reflection on the desk. <laughs> what happened was they did it, whoever did this painting, again, they think it was this Valentine de Bologna. Um, I'm probably butchering even pronouncing that. Whoever did this painting uh, painted over an earlier painting of Jesus with a crown of thorns. And he paint, just painted over top the picture of Jesus with the crown of thorns. And over the years, as the painting is kind of worn down, this image of Jesus with the crown of thorns sort of seeped through the painting. And, it, and again, it, it appears that it's Paul's face, but it's not. It's Jesus bleeding through. And I, I, I kind of, I, this painting probably wasn't like inspired by the book of Philemon, but I, I think it is a wonderful like visual example of the book of Philemon. Here is Paul writing a very ordinary letter, an ordinary letter about a practical issue. But in the midst of this ordinary letter, Jesus is bleeding through the grace of Jesus all of us getting what we don't deserve because of his sacrificial love. That's what you typically don't see in Flying Lehman unless you're looking for it. But once you see it, it's there. And that's the way grace is. Once you've tasted it, once you see it, once you experience it, it ought to bleed through into your everyday life. And so I guess I leave you with that, with that question where um, in your practical as a labor day, as we talk about life and work and all this kind of stuff and living every day in the real world and the tensions of labor and capital and markets and all that kind of stuff, where, right, where does the grace of God, where's the love of Jesus need to bleed through into your everyday life? Where do you need to see Jesus where you might not see him, where you can get stuck like Philemon maybe got stuck, like this slave, he left, he stole from me. Like, where do you need to see Jesus again? There's a lot to this little book, a lot we can see and maybe some things we don't normally see until we look, but I think there's a good reason that God had it included into his scriptures. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for 
both this picture of dignity, of the dignity of all people, and also this amazing picture of grace. Lord, those two truths uh, should, could be anchors in our lives. Where do we need to see people that maybe we overlook, uh, see the dignity in everyone? And also, Lord, where do we need to see your grace in our everyday lives? Where, like Philemon, have we been given so much that we have maybe lost track of? Where do we need to remember the grace that we've been given so that we can give the grace we're called to give? Help us do that, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.